Now, before we go to the presentation, I'd like to see who we have in the room. I've actually got three questions. One is, uh, what sort of discipline you're in? Finance, admin, so people making proposals, or tech, solar, what have you. So who's in the finance sector in the audience? Please raise your hand. Okay. So are we competition or colleagues? Colleagues, fine, thank you. Who's in the admin sector? Who makes financing proposals and need, needs to provide all the data and answer the nasty questions that we ask? Nobody. Okay, that's a lost opportunity. Uh, who's in the tech side, you know, developing? Uh, aha, there's the engineers. No ladies, just guys? Ah, there you go. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, so lots of financiers. Okay, that, that. I say the other people should tell us when we are going too much in depth on technical stuff because if there are finance people talking to each other, we may get, we, we may lose track. So please raise your hand if we're losing track. Second question: Who, if you're looking for to sort of, and you're in a business or if you're looking for funding, who's looking for equity and who's looking for debt? Because that also makes a lot of a difference in how we tune the, the presentation. Who's looking for equity or who is in the equity business? Ah. Let's say I'm saying half. And debt? Okay. And then who's investing? Who has money? Who has debt? Ah, I see. There's one investor, two, three. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, that money is gone by the end of this session. Um, then, in talking about sectors. Who's in the off-grid sector? Who's in the mini-grid sector? This presentation is a little sort of, you know, tweak towards mini-grids, but don't get... Um, and then the other is who's in the other sector. So who's in the uh, off-grid sector? Okay. Who's in mini-grid? Few people. Who's in grid-connected and other stuff, nuclear or whatever? A few people. Okay. All right. So we have mostly finance people, mostly equity need, and um, I say very mostly um, off-grid people. Okay. That's, that's clear. The... Uh, title of this presentation is Investors Expectations from Mini-Grid Developers. Now, Mini-Grid is only one topic we deal with. Uh, the presentation and the discussion mostly will definitely uh, be wider than that. Uh, this is what we're planning to discuss. Um, talking about Mini-Grid space, you see to the left you know, the, the, um, uh, the Mini-Grids more on the, say, hydro and solar diesel and biomass. To the right you see the, the off-grid stuff. So the mini-grid space is a little bit in the middle uh, where the national grid doesn't come in yet. That's how we've been looking at what the financing needs might be determined by. Uh, as I said, this is actually the only exclusive sheet on mini-grids, but that's how we look at mini-grids. Oh yeah, if you wanted to ask questions, this is a, I think there's about 10 or 12 sheets. Maybe I'll just run through the presentation uh, and then uh, ask your questions, but if you have a compelling question, please ask right away. So, our idea is that, that mini-grids uh, are uh, an important sector that is very difficult to finance right now. It's been using a lot of uh, subsidy, there you go. Um, it's a matter of scale, it's a matter of your uh, purchaser, your client, a lot of elements that, uh, that have prevented mini grids from getting into, uh, into the business so far. Uh, nothing much we can change about that. It's to do with risk appetite from investors and with a little, say, thin track record at, the, at this moment. So if there's an interest in discussing mini grids particularly, but I'm, I'm wondering whether that is the case, let's do so and let's take a little time maybe in the session or if it's only two or three people after the session, uh, we're available uh, to discuss that, let's do that. Um, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's not a, a business case as solid as you would see in other subsectors. Um, uh, we have to lower the default rates, we have to sh make sure that there are predictable cash flows, and for that to happen you have to have more experience, you have to have more risk capital and that's equity mostly and that's why we'll uh, be talking about equity a little bit further down in this uh, session. Right, so this is more the general part of the presentation, how to apply for funding. Um, 
I think the the um, the, uh, the top line, the assuming that your audience, which is if you are applying, the audience is the financier, uh, understands the basics. Well, that's something you have to test for sure, because basics can be very different. If you think basics to be P&L and cash flow, that is basics. But if you are in a specific sector, such as mini grids, but pay as you go, I, I'm assuming is also a very specific sector at this point. Do explain that in depth and make sure before you present anything to an investor, whether debt or equity, that you understand his or her or their drivers. Very important because otherwise your presentation or your, your uh, application may completely miss the point. Very important. Um, uh, the others are more uh, practical suggestions that we've seen a lot of novels and a lot of uh, other type of literature being presented to investors uh, assuming it was going to be a financial proposal or a financing proposal that's not the need that's not what we need we look at so many proposals that the the, the reading of the, the how it came into business and when you were born and whatever is not so very interesting it's really interesting to know i'm in this sector these are my numbers these are my risks this is my expectation and this is what i'm asking from you of course, if you go to a regular bank, that may be different. You need to present your background, but I think the financiers in this room, I hope I'm right, are all specialized or specialist financiers. There's no general bank interested in our business as of yet. Maybe at the next Gogla meeting, we will see a few general banks, but at this point, most financiers are aware of the basics of a particular business. So sizing down your proposal and, and making it very simple, uh, as in to the point is important. Um, right. Um, again, uh, uh, in addition to the words, uh, structures, and, and uh, so organograms and diagrams, picturing if you're in a mini grid, you know, how does the energy flow, who's the buyer, where's the, the, the power source, and so on, do explain a lot. Oftentimes, if you use some words to explain that, makes a lot of sense, but adding pictures and diagrams does do a lot. I would say nothing different from any other presentation that you make if you have to convince your board, or your directors or your colleagues from anything. Financiers are just normal people. Um, this is a this is as true as it can be, and I'm not trying to annoy any of the financiers that are really quick in reacting. But um, generally speaking, when you apply for financing, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a process that aims to mitigate the risk in uh, investing. And that's important to explain, since the lower the risk that is perceived by the investor in your business, the better the terms that will be offered to you. So the better they understand the opportunity, the better they understand the risks, the better their colleagues, so not just the person, the loan officer or the equity investor that you're talking to, but also their admin people and their monitoring people understand your business. The better they do so, the easier you will get your capital, your money, and the lower the interest you will pay or the sweeter the terms that you will get. So you have to allow time to have your uh, proposal processed. Take that into account uh, when you start fundraising and do appreciate when you get questions six weeks or eight weeks later because that means that your, your app uh, application is being processed. It's not just the, the person that you meet that makes the decision. Obviously, if your investor is an angel investor operating by him or herself, that may be different. But those typically would also check with their peers and friends what it is that they're about to invest in. This is the uh, process that we're typically talking about and, and Audrey will agree that this is uh, uh, sort of a blend of uh, equity and debt uh, as it is being presented here. Uh, what happens oftentimes is that you present your business plan that's being assessed, maybe it's updated, maybe you provide a few uh, extra data and then the financier makes like a decision in principle and on that basis you will receive a draft term sheet, a term sheet saying this is the amount, this is the purpose, and these are the basic conditions. If it's a debt side, it'll be interest rate and tenure and a few other 
technical things which we will actually discuss in the next session so we're not going to do, go into depth into term sheets in this session um, and then you have an opportunity to discuss that is actually the only real opportunity to discuss the terms of your investment because once it moves on to the investment recommendation and further down um, so many people within the investment firm of the bank that have been committed to the initial term sheet it'll be very difficult to adjust it further down so although it says draft term sheet non-binding you know non-committing whatever that's the deal that is the deal so every single line in there matters if your experience in obtaining financing is limited make sure you find someone advisors or you know colleagues that have been there before to help you guide through that term sheet it is what you get the rest will just be details technical uh, conditions uh, stuff you would rather not read but need to read the term sheet is all that matters it, once you sign up on the term sheet there's very very little room to maneuver um, <coughs> From the term sheet, which is a one, two, three, four page thing, usually, uh, and maybe Audrey can expand on one, uh, it goes to the investment recommendation, which you oftentimes don't see. That's an internal document with analysis of the market, of the competition, of the product life cycle, of the something else, just to inform the investor what that particular deal is part of in a wider landscape. Of course, uh, the people reading that document may not have met you, so they will ask questions that they would not have asked if they had met you. Sometimes the investment officer needs to ask those questions to you again, and therefore you need to take into account some processing time for that process to happen. But as I said earlier, it's very important that you realize that this is all about a group of people trying to understand your business, which is a novel, innovative business for the time being. And obviously, then they will check whether what you said is actually true, due diligence, and whether the documents that you had promised uh, that, was that were going to be there uh, actually represent what it is that they say, like land rights or power purchase agreements. And eventually you go to the final term sheet, which is uh, sort of uh, what you sign off on, and then it's legal agreements. Audrey, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit what you do as SunFunder when you talk with and about term sheets. Sure. Oh, I wanted to go back on maybe a few points. Uh, you know, one of them was, you know, you said assume investors know the space. And I think before that, you really need to do your research on investors. Um, I, I think that sometimes you feel like, you know, you're the one that's being, you know, the due diligence is on you. But I also recommend that you do, you do due diligence on your investors to make sure that they're going to be aligned, particularly equity investors. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize that. Um, I mean, for us, particularly during our seed round, we actually, when I tell people this, they're like, that's crazy. We had uh, 14 angel investors um, that all came in. Um, and because their investment amount was not super substantial, they left us control of, of the company. And really, that phase of your business, you're doing a lot of experimenting. And I can tell you, like, our original sort of hypothesis was is quite different. I mean, the mission is the same. It's quite different from we do today. Um, so, I mean, I th if we had been held back and if we had, you know, you want investors that really believe in the management team early stage and are really going to give you, you know, trust and give you leeway to, to experiment. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to emphasize. Um, on the timeline, yes, we've experienced this and that goes to back to research as well. Talk to other uh, portfolio companies, um, you know, we did a lot of that. Like, how long? How long did it take to actually secure the investment? Um, have they been able to do follow-on, you know, investments or loans? So that should be a big part of your diligence because sometimes you'll have an investment officer that's pretty frank about the timeline, but you know, other times it can really mess up your cash flow. Um, for us, Sunfunder, we try to make this very quick, um, as long as. I mean, we don't ask for a business plan like a big board document per se, um, but we have a diligence checklist. So even if you're not quite ready um, for us, at least get our checklist ahead of time so you can get ready. It's the checklist is not, you know, I think unusual. Um, so you know that's why it's actually useful for us when we've uh, when 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 a uh, I mean it's quite rare, but when a, a potential uh, company says, hey, we have a data room, I'm like what? That's amazing. 
Um, because once we have all the materials, we can move through this pretty quickly. And my investment, one of my investment officers in the room right there, Shalmith, put your hand up, please, so you can talk to her. Um, they're going to push us really hard to get this done. You know, I mean, we, I think we did one deal in a month. Um, so they're incentivized, uh, and they're, they're, they're some hustlers in my team. So we actually have weekly investment or credit committee meetings. So the credit committee members are available on a weekly basis. Um, and you know, you know, we're not going to wait a month or every quarter to review a bunch of applications. Uh, so yeah, we can get through this pretty quickly. Um, it's true that once you know, the investment package goes through the credit committee, it is more difficult to renegotiate things. So I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, in terms of the term sheet, yeah, our term sheet is about four pages. It's, you know, we're a lender. I don't think it's anything unusual. Um, you know, I've looked at other lenders' term sheets. I think nothing unusual there. I think it's, it's really the, the equity investor term sheets that you're going to be spending a lot more time. I remember as a first time, well, first time uh, raising uh, Series A, I was doing a lot of Googling and I was on a lot of blogs. Um, and speaking to other entrepreneurs when you're raising your equity, I think is really the best research that you can do. Um, but I don't know, I think that term sheets are pretty standard. Um, I don't know, Michael, if you have like uh, frequently asked questions on your term sheet or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty standard. Um, so I think that's, that's really all I have to add. Yeah. And, and you made an interesting uh, uh, comment earlier. Uh, your first round with, was with 14 angel investors and your whole business plan comprised of one page? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so here's what we submitted for a seed round. It was a two page actually. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and it was essentially like you know, the problem, what was like our solution, um, team, and then it was like we want, these are the milestones we want to accomplish with you know, half a million dollars, um, and you know, this is how we're going to use the funds, this is how we're going to break it down. And that's really useful because you'll get rejected by a lot of investors. So then when you're raising your next round, you say, hey, remember that milestone doc that I sent you? I'm going to give you a status update on each one of those. And it was literally, we relisted those milestones and status. Done, done, in progress, we rethought this. Um, and that was really useful because, uh, yeah, it, it definitely brought people that originally did not were not interested in seed um, into our Series A, um, and I think if if there's one thing to emphasize, like a no is never a no. Well, it depends on you know how stubborn you are. Um, but we have we kept in touch with all of those investors that we liked and that we wanted on. So we send quarterly investor updates. You know we we've, we've done these okay. we've done these from the beginning. Um, and we have sent them even to investors that said no, to show them like, hey, you didn't believe we could do this, but we did, you know, you're interested now. Um, and keep that, you know, Rolodex, you know, keep that Google sheet going and keep adding to it um, and just keep in touch with investors. Well, that, that's one thing. The business model is very, well, no, the their proposition is relatively simple. In, you, the, the business that they invest in is, say known at large, not technically speaking, you have a very specific niche in that sector which an investor might understand rather quickly. And then on the basis of the two pages, sorry, and the people, because that's the key thing. As they say, in, 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 it's, it's the man, not the plan. So that includes the ladies. Um, when you sit in front of an investor, that's when you make it happen. You know, I oftentimes when I raise funds for my clients, I choose to send like a, an email, not even a term sheet, or just to get connected. And then when I meet people, I figure out in two minutes whether this is, this is going to be a very useful conversation and what the investor is actually interested in and how much money he or she or they have available and how much of that in, and under which conditions I would be willing to accept that. Because it's, you didn't say that yet, but it's not yet, not just the money that you're looking for. Sometimes it's also the network of that one investor, because if one investor believes in you and he tells his friends, hey, I've met Audrey, she's got this great plan, I'll put in whatever 500,000, if you do another 500,000 on uh, you two, we're, we're at you know, 1.5, come on. 
or they say, well, you know, you're in this particular subsector, but I happen to be in, you know, PayPal, so I know a little bit of that, and maybe you can use that, and that's where it happens. So if you send a term sheet or an extended business plan, particularly for angel investors, they'll start reading, starting asking detailed mini questions, and you don't get the opportunity to address them as an entrepreneur, which is very important on the equity side of things. This is for more formal approaches, business plan, term sheets, because in, in Audrey's case, you sit in front of an investor, you have this one page, and at the end of the meeting, you have a sense like, oh, okay, this might work, and then you follow up, and then some of this may apply, but not all of it, yeah, right? I think what we would follow up with is obviously a, a financial plan, but we, we had a summary page that was easily digestible. Um, I mean, even as an investor, we love detail, but sometimes it's, it's just, it's overkill. Um, and really the numbers have to communicate something. So I think that was helpful. We send them like a summary snapshot of our financial plan. And then, you know, if they want to get into more detail, we send them a spreadsheet, walk them through it on the phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's see what else we have on uh, the presentation. Okay. So, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so this is more like uh, the, the content or the index of a business plan um, uh, as you would present it to an investor. Um, as mentioned before, don't start with history and your family life and what have you, but present the business opportunity first. Because if you're an investor, particularly on the equity side, I don't know how many deals you get to see in a week, but it's many. So if you have to plow through the family history and country specifics and what have you, I'm not so interested in that. This is my business, this is how much I expect to earn, this is what I ask from you, these are the risks, this, this is the upside, are you interested, please read on. And then everything else comes, you know, uh, timetable, capital structure, if it's project finance, which is one section of finance industry, you have to be relatively specific on legal and technical side. I'm not sure we should address that in this seminar, but feel free to ask if you want to. If it's on corporate financing, it's about the team and the marketing and, and the risks of building up a market. That's easier to explain and should actually be explained in a business plan. Um, when there are risks, and I guess most of your businesses have no risks, uh, do explain how to mitigate them uh, or do explain why they don't apply to you because some risks, risks they may be perceived risks, so an investor may think that applies to you, but you may convince that it doesn't, and that therefore your business plan is excellent, a very commonly overseen uh, opportunity in a business. Um, you may choose to, particularly on equity and particularly in the second round, uh, to put a few words on valuation in your business plan, but if it is seed capital, angel investors, it's probably not worth uh, the words uh, describing it. It's more about the opportunity and the entrepreneur. Um, of course, for everybody, it's uh, particularly on the uh, equity side, it's, it's important to explain what your thoughts are about exit, which is to sell the shares or to, to, to sort of um, uh, free up the money after a while. There are many opportunities for that, anything from paying back the investor with the profits to uh, finding, as they say, secondary investors, so not the same type of investor, but bigger ticket investors and so on. Uh, and if you have ideas on that, you should present them lightly. I don't think you, you sell your proposition by uh, emphasizing the, 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 the exit opportunity. And in particular in Africa, if you say, I'm going to do an IPO, an initial public offering on the stock exchange of whatever, you might not make yourself extra credible. It's mostly uh, not going to go that way. And I've seen a lot of business plans that said, the way I'm going, I'm going to be uh, stock listed in five or 10 years. And some investors lose interest by just reading that because it's not a very likely thing to happen. Um, and of course, evidence, if you have, you know, um, intellectual property documents, if you have uh, land rights, if that's applicable, if you have uh, power purchase agreements or, you know, if you have key people uh, that you need to present with it, diplomas of or what have you, that should be presented in a snapshot. Maybe not all the details, just take a picture of some agreement and put in the lines what it is that that document represents because nobody's going to read a legal document. It's, it's just to prove that you understand what the investor is looking for at the end of the day. Um, 
This, of course, is the uh, the uh, most important part, um, other than the, the, the actual content of what you're doing. Um, and it, it applies to two elements. Um, generally speaking, you, you look for for more than one funder, uh, debt and equity, but in debt you can look for more risk appetite debt and less risk appetite debt. Uh, you can look for investors, equity investors who just bring the money, but also investors that have something else to offer like previous business experience or senior like a non-executive director role that you have to be uh, stating relatively explicitly maybe in a cover letter to your business plan but somewhere it has to be explicit because if you just send the standard business plan to every investor you may also miss an opportunity to address the specific interest of that investor or to explain where that investor's money makes a difference compared to other investors and again, we, I don't think we should get technical on financing here, but if you wish, we can do so and then distinguish between money for marketing, money for, uh, say, working capital, buying stocks, money to invest in, in equipment, money to do other stuff. There's all money. There's all money you need. There's all money that you're asking for, but it's different money. It's got different profiles. Maybe it's got different risks. Maybe it takes longer to repay the one say subset of money than it does for the other and that's relevant information for an investor um, right and then the most difficult one and i'm not sure whether it's the most important one to be precise on but be honest to yourself at least on your timeline um, I, i've seen I'm, i mean I've some anecdotes that i won't be sharing with you now but i've seen timelines that said come on you know or a timeline saying, uh, thank you dear investor for having uh, interest in my business. Uh, our plan starts January 2015. So the plan was never updated. You know? And they're still fundraising, that's fine, but do update your plan. Do include lessons learned and do all that kind of stuff. In implementation, be realistic. Uh, as we just saw, obtaining financing may take six to eight months and in some cases even longer. And before you have your money, you can't roll. So make sure that that is represented in the business plan. And don't say eight weeks or two weeks or four weeks, all that I've seen. So be precise in a timeline and break down the timeline a little in what you plan to do, particularly specific to your uh, business. Um, maybe only this is one that you could, could address. Uh, how much time and money have you spent so that you are credible to a financier, to an investor, and what type of equity, and again, not too technical, are we talking about? That's a really good question, and I think pretty different uh, for every entrepreneur. Um, I mean, in our case, I think Ryan was essentially working without a salary for about a year, um, so he put in a lot of sweat equity. For me, it was about six months. Um, and, and then obviously when the, the seed came in, we, we took a, a discounted salary, but you know, something that was reasonable. Um, you know, I think investors want to make sure that their entrepreneurs are, are not killing themselves, right? Um, and yeah, I think it was for us mostly sweat equity. Um, I had come out of an expensive graduate degree program, so I didn't have much cash to put in, but I put in a little bit um, just to kind of show a gesture. Um, you know, it wasn't much on the cap table, but for me it was significant enough to matter. <laughs> yeah. And was that appreciated? You know, not, I think it was more appreciated by uh, Ryan. I mean, at, at that point I was really kind of, you know, I'm going to be co-founder, so let me convince you how um, committed I am. Right. Um, and then when the investors came in, I mean, they looked at that, and I think some of the more institutional, larger investors that we approached, that was one of the questions on their checklist, but with the angel investors that we ended up um, working with in our seed round, it wasn't as much as really seeing me move, pack up my life in New York, move to Tanzania, um, and just make a, a big life change to show my commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then uh, after a while, you had a second round of financing, and you introduced, as many do, the Series A and Series B uh, shares. Could you briefly explain how that works and why you did that? Yeah, I mean, you know, SunFunder is, is a company where um, we need to be at scale to be profitable. So 
we always knew, and we need to build a team of finance professionals, and um, we need to, particularly in the in the local markets, be competitive, right? So we're going to be taking people from from banks and and management consulting firms and accounting firms. Um, so really, we needed manpower, and that's most of where our um, our equity has been used um, for Series A. You know, obviously, finding that lead investor. Um, is always really important, and that's where the seed investors can actually play a role by facilitating introductions, vouching, um, saying, you know, we're coming back in because we're really happy. Um, yeah, so our, our lead investor was Coastal Impact. Um, you know, Ryan and I were a bit nervous about um, having a more VC-oriented investor on the cap table. Um, we spoke uh, at length about it, but we met the investment manager and really felt uh, very good about it. Um, Schneider also came in, so we had a nice mix of kind of impact VC and energy companies. Um, now, this was a very interesting question. This is the first time we're like trying to figure out what is our valuation. Okay, there are like so many blog posts about this. It was really confusing. Um, and at the same time, you know, we wanted to show a financial plan that was exciting enough, but also we're not uh, we don't like to exaggerate as a, as a like Ryan and I as a, as a culture that we share. Um, so we also had many discussions about, you know, we, I mean, we had some people tell us, you know, equity investors expect you to like, you know, exaggerate your numbers. They're just going to like half the revenue numbers that you show or like double the timeline that it takes you to get there. So I don't know. I don't know if there's probably equity investors in the room. I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's the way that you see it or not. Um, so we kind of went for a, a middle ground, you know. We didn't quite double uh, the projections, but we maybe, you know, pushed them up and made them ambitious yet realistic was the words that we love to use. Um, and then in terms of that valuation question, you know, it, we were pretty clueless, I have to admit. I mean, it was our first time doing this. In the end, you know, we sat down and um, at the time said, you know, with kind of the founding team, all right, how much would you be sell willing to sell the business for in like, let's say five years from now, 10 years from now? And we each wrote a number on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're like, what did you put down? And then, so that gave us an indication of really how we felt, what we felt the business was worth. Um, so that was for Series A. Of course, what we had put on Series A was, the aim of Series A is to reach profitability. Um, so maybe those investors were right because it took us, it's going to take us longer. Um, and, and so, you know, we did a follow-up round with Series B. I mean, if I have to break it down, Seed was market scoping, like getting out, trying to figure out who are really get to know our customers are, like what's the best, you know, products that we can um, build for them, what's, what's the kind of right team we need to put into place. Series A was like getting the team into place, you know, we had to open a regional office, um, you know, making our first loans, getting to a portfolio of X, build, um, fundraising our first uh, part of the solar empowerment fund, you know, kind of doing that track record. And then Series B is saying like, okay, we figured out how to do all of this and we're going to scale this up. Um, so if I may interrupt, for Series B you had a different purpose for the money. And did you also yeah. offer different terms or different rights or different something else to the investors? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the ones that come in earlier are taking more risk. Um, who actually of the... Um, entrepreneurs in the room, can you put your hand? Are you looking for seed? Like, at what stage are you? Maybe seed? Okay. Series A? Seed. Any Series B? Okay, so we've got one there. Okay, so it's quite early stage. Huh? Um, well, one thing we did for seed is it's always really difficult to get your very first investors in. Um, so, sorry, I'm taking it a step back just based on the audience. Sure, sure. Uh, we actually gave people like, it's going to sound crazy, like a Christmas discount. So we've been talking to a bunch of seed investors and we're like, we need to get out there. We need money for travel. Like we can't work without a salary anymore. If you commit before December of 2012, you'll get a bigger discount than the ones that come in later on in the year. So we closed the seed round in July of 2013, but we at least had a bit of money in the bank in December 2012 so that I could come out here and, and just get start getting to work. Um, that was quite useful because then also the other ones in the group were like, oh wow, you know, man, Jeb Davidson, like or whoever came in earlier and now, you know, um, so first move, get try and incentivize those first movers by offering very good, very entrepreneurial terms. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have to say my business partner is an excellent negotiator. Um, 
And so well, Series don't A. Don't discount yourself. Yeah. Uh, so Series A. Um, yeah, the negotiations were harder there, you know, because that's when you're really entering. It, it's not. It's no longer just about the team. It's really like, you know, what's our exit strategy? What's our valuation? Um, one tip I do have for entrepreneurs, I see some, I don't know, there's like multi co-founders right here, for example. Fundraising takes so much time and energy. Um, so when, when, actually when you're putting sweat equity, it's like how much of my sweat equity I put into fundraising, you know? Uh, so I recommend like what Ryan and I did was like, you know, at one point we said, we can't both be on fundraising or we're never gonna move the needle. Like I trust you to fundraise bring me on catch up calls, send me notes. In the end, if there's last minute decisions that have to be made, I trust you with the decision so that I can go and build the business on the ground. Because otherwise you're going to be stuck in this trap and you're not gonna be able to move forward. You're not gonna be able to show a track record. You know, so let's say you've been speaking to a, an investor for six months, you're like, well, when I spoke to you six months ago, you know, you're pretty much where you still are today. I was like, yeah, because we don't, we've been waiting for cash to come in. Um, so I think splitting up duties and really trusting your business partner is is something that's, that worked really well, yeah. Okay, thank you. A uh, few more sheets uh, to go, right? Um, can you read what's there? Okay, it's got two things in it. Uh, there's no risk-free money, that is why you pay interest rates over the transaction costs. That's why you are charged, if you like, you know, uh, real uh, rates of return on capital because there's no real risk-free business. And for uh, an investor to appreciate the deal, um, uh, it's important to understand that you yourself see risks, that you, that you give them a name, that you describe them, and of course that you describe, describe how you deal with them. So that at the end of the day, for you as the entrepreneur, they represent, say, uh, justifiable risks that won't kill the business if they happen, and if they happen, you have a way of dealing with them. Um, oftentimes, although the discussion with the entrepreneur and the, uh, between the entrepreneur and the investor is about the business, the underlying theme is risks. So I like your business, tell me more, and then I'm listening, risk, 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 risk management, risk management, mitigation, mitigation. Very important to put that up front very clearly, because if you don't, an investor will walk away saying, ah, great plan, but does this guy know what he's doing? Because where's the risk? I didn't hear him talk, talk about risk. And if you talk about risk, quantify the risk, like as Audrey, for example, indicated, it may take us six months extra to do this and this milestone, which would cost X in salaries and Y in travel costs and something else and something else. It's important to understand this sort of burn rate issue, that if you are nearly there, but you're not there yet, how much extra it would cost to continue that little extra so that the investor knows that if he commits 100,000 and it doesn't work with 100,000, if at least another 20,000, then would we'll do the job if you wouldn't get there at the time you had foreseen. That sort of risk mitigation is very, very, very important. And last page, use investor language. So understand who you're talking to. Make sure, as already explained, you Google and you research who you're talking to. Um, uh, have somebody else, like uh, colleagues, read your document. Don't be too afraid about business confidential information. Uh, for example, I never signed, uh, nearly ever signed um, a uh, letter of uh, non-disclosure, since if I read this and I walk away with that knowledge, me, I as an investor, end of my business. So my reputation is in sticking uh, to your business and keeping the stuff confidential. But at the same time, if I read what you uh, if I understand what you read, what, what you send to me, and I can do your business, it wouldn't be good business after all, because it would not have a lot of proprietary uh, rights or information that you could build your business on. Um, and I think we addressed most of that. Right. Yeah, I think, Audrey? Yeah, I think having like an independent third eye um, with a fresh set of eyes, reread your documents is, is definitely highly recommended. Because you know you and at that stage like that's your entire world, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I had you know my father, he was in the oil and gas industry, um, so I was like he might be a good audience, like if I can convince him, you know. Um, so that was a good person. Like I hadn't told him what I was up to. I was like read this, you know, first thoughts, like first criticism, first risks. 
and just get kind of a fresh set of eyes from you know someone that understands you know maybe the wider part of the sector but um, can really be pointed with some constructive criticism. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, time for questions and answers. I don't know how much time we have left. We just have about uh, only ten minutes left of this session before moving into the next. Oh, one. okay. Um, and just with the questions, we are actually recording the session. So if you have a question, if you could put your hand up and wait till the mic comes to you before asking the question, so it get, gets captured on the video. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Femi Fadigba, and I am a senior associate at Cross Boundary Energy. We finance commercial and industrial solar projects across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so my question is around capital structure, and I guess. How do you, especially sort of at the Series A stage, how do you think about the trade-offs or do you have any frameworks for thinking about how you'd allocate sort of shares versus preferred shares or convertible notes um, versus other instruments like debt? So uh, as Sun Funder, as, so we're, we're a debt investor, Sun Funder. Um, so I, I'm not sure how, do you want me to answer your question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I mean when you're actually Oh, when we're raising money for ourselves. <sighs> Good question. Um, at Series A, our number one priority was just not to lose control. So, as a, as the founders, um, so I mean, I have to think back from two years ago, but that's the one sticking point that resonates. Is like we wanted to make sure that um, Ryan and I had control of the board, um, control over major decisions. So, you know. That's sort of how we, we thought about things. <laughs> yeah. It's also very specific yeah, to so the very project or company that you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you're an entrepreneur inventor, so you need other people around you. So you need to share the ownership of the company with the other entrepreneurs that you're looking for. So you're looking for a co-entrepreneur investor. Sometimes you have it all under control. You just need the money. That gives you sort of what Audrey's talking about. If it's project financing, as again, we won't go there in detail, you have to structure your, your set-aside deal, your special purpose vehicle, oftentimes, uh, aside from the management company that is developing everything, and you have two sets of rights. So it's pretty specific. One of the elements we pointed out is that, uh, and I'm not saying that's personal for you, but do engage a financial advisor in your business plan, even if yourself are from the finance sector, because you get you develop some kind of a tunnel vision because you want to have your deal financed and your company funded and what have you and you start to sort of forget what you were uh, trained uh, during university or in practice on how to structure a deal and to step away from your own biases your own preferences in how to structure a deal so ask your friends particularly the ones you don't like that much to uh, look at your deal do you have any specific example of a mini grid solution that you have founded and what is the key decision factor to do that? Mini grid was one of the topics, and I think the message, particularly when we prepared this session, was that it was actually a wider audience, which I think it is indeed. Um, the short version is that I've seen a few mini grids have uh, advised on investing, particularly advised on restructuring investments that hadn't gone all the way to the success level. And at this point, and, and if anybody in the room can, can prove me wrong, I have not yet seen a successful, as in at this point profitable, making a profit, uh, mini grid. Mini grids are very relevant as a, the next step in off grid or in semi grid electrification. But uh, it, the, 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 um, say the problem, if you like, I don't like to talk in terms of problems, but the problem with mini grid is that on the one hand it is off grid. So you have the technology and everything that comes with it. That is real off-grid, so it's proven. But on the other end, it has some kind of a grid connection thing with contracts and consumers and grids and stuff in it, which makes it susceptible to risks that have not yet been managed or proven to be uh, manageable. So there are not that many uh, that have been invested in. I must say many investors, and those of you who are interested, please raise your hands are looking to see the next or the first mini grid that can be made into a success. So it's, it's the real sweet spot. If you know how to do it, there must be investors that, that like to, to discuss it with you. But it's, it's, unless somebody else can prove me wrong, as I said, I haven't seen many mini grids that have become profitable at this point. So the, 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 the key trick how to do it, I can't tell you because that would be driven by the uh, first success. 
I don't want to do a dialogue, but honestly speaking, uh, since I came uh, in, in Kenya, uh, I've been here two weeks, uh, I see all the political politics, all the government officers talking about mini-grid, mini-grid, mini-grid. But we know what we are talking about. So that's my question. <laughs> so we don't, this, uh, some of the mini-grid I saw is just prototype. So it's not proven concept. Uh, I agree with you. So yeah. I'm really surprised why the, 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 the government officer, the, 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 the energy authority is focusing on the mini-grid. Oh, okay. Well, that I may be able to at least help you with. Um, once you uh, have a decently operating mini grid, the investment is uh, uh, lead, can lead to scale of access to energy, which is the political word that goes beyond a similar investment in off grid, and is maybe more expensive than actual full grid connection. But then full grid connection may not be applicable or affordable in that space. So it's something that politics are looking for and many developers and entrepreneurs are trying to achieve. But in the middle, there's the connection between licenses and uh, agreements and what have you, and the whole thing to make it happen. And that's not been proven on a commercial or scalable basis, as far as I know. But as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the market has become so big in Africa, that it's impossible to know what's happening. So if anybody has or knows of a, a commercially viable uh, mini grid, please let him or her raise the hand or hands even. There's one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm Pepen Chwate from Africa. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't have any example of mini grid, but I just want to share a word about his concern why uh, political, uh, politicians are pushing or the women are pushing on mini grid. It is also clear that rural electrification by grid extension is not affordable economically it's not a viable solution because when you extend so it is only so, uh, viable because of cross subsidization so what is expected is that this crop subsidization also could apply to mini grid projects in order to make them uh, viable and this is the key uh, question thank you Thanks, Audrey. Um, my name is Shazia Khan. I am a co-founder of Eco Energy. We do um, distribution of off-grid solar in Pakistan. My question is, uh, how do you most effectively address the political risk when you're working in a very volatile market? What's the most effective way to address political risk in your investment proposal? Be honest, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I think it goes back to Paul's first point of, you know, expect that the investors have knowledge on this. Um, and I mean, as a debt investor, I can say that, you know, the more transparent a company is with us about the risks, um, the better. And even if there's risks that are about to occur and haven't occurred yet, but they warn us ahead of time, uh, but they say, you know, this is the risk, this is, and then obviously have a plan. But I think you know honesty and transparency really works. Um, I'd love to hear from other investors in the room. Well, I, I can add two two comments. The one is that uh, depending on the say the level of your political concern, local, uh, regional, or national, uh, be informed. Uh, have a thought leader or I say autonomous uh, opinion leader uh, tell you what the risks are. Uh, be very frank, but at the same time, do not engage with political people in your business. I mean, inside of your business, you can meet them, of course, the politicians, you should meet them. But as soon as you get them inside of your business, you make your business very vulnerable. It's nothing against political people, but have them in your business, makes your business go up and down with the political uh, movement, which is a risk. But informing yourself via, via local people or, or whatever, regional or national, on what's going to happen, uh, is very, very important. I mean, I think for us and for a lot of people that are working in markets that are considered volatile, we don't actually see the political risk to be the same as other investors who are maybe not as familiar with this part of the world see it. The way that we see it is we are serving a market that's extremely underserved. There's 70 million people off-grid in Pakistan, 
And these people need energy to, you know, they need to meet their energy needs. They need electricity to, in order to be productive and to lead more comfortable lives. We don't see the political risk as something that affects our customers on a day-to-day -day basis. There is uncertainty. There are pockets of uncertainty in, in places around the country where, you know, sporadically there will be acts of violence committed. Our customers don't see that for the most part, and they're not affected. Um, but how do you convince someone who's not familiar with that part of the world that it's very unlikely that, that the political risk that they're hearing about in the news yeah. is something that's you know, really going to probably affect exactly. your customers? Yeah, so there's two things. One is step back in your own learning curve. How did you know, learn about rural electrification and what did you think initially about the risks and the don'ts and the, it wouldn't work and how you moved along that learning ladder and how you learned about what is not a risk but only a perceived risk. Um, because once you get into the sector you have this own, I, I call it tunnel vision, but it may be a bias. And when I'm an investor, particularly if I'm not from the sector, I probably hardly understand what you're talking about. Your, your words, your jargon, your, uh, your assumptions may be informed by what you've been doing for a number of years. And that you have to realize yourself. The other thing is, if there's a million investors in the world, there may be only a hundred that are interested in your business. So you may be talking to the wrong investors. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Audrey mentioned that she we talked to many, many investors before she had a subset of people that she liked. So just not anybody, everybody is interested in off-grid in Pakistan or in Zambia for that matter. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam Enujikan. I'm CEO of Pesola in Nigeria. And my question is a little different. So I come to this industry from the tech sector. From the what? From the tech sector, okay. technology sector in the States. And the question I have in the back of my mind is, what is the end game um, in this space? Um, and from two sides, the entrepreneur side and the investor side. Um, from the uh, impact investors, yeah, we kind of know what they're after. They want to make an impact. But it's clear that once you go past your seed round or maybe Series A, you can't, the funding you need to scale or grow, to run your business, you can't get it from the impact investor, you go to the markets. Their um, uh, goal is clear. They want low risk and they want return for their, for their investors. So on the entrepreneur side, what is the risk and who are the examples that we can look at? We've got five top ones. How close are they to being profitable? Um, what are the exit expectations? They're obviously talking to investors that have these types of mindset, but um, are, this, are, are we supposed to be in the completely impact side, 20% impact thinking, and then 80% commercial thinking? And you know, what can we anticipate uh, once we get out of this you know, um, taking impact money? Um, and who can we look at that's actually going towards that out of, I mean, you guys probably see, you know, all the profiles, how close are they to being profitable? And, you know, especially on the upgrade side, you know, on the um, solar home system side, what is really, you know, what are we looking at, where are we going? So in tech sector, it's clear. I'm trying to figure it out for this sector. That is an excellent question. Uh, <laughs> so we're a lender, we look at things a bit differently. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you were there at my presentation yesterday, but I sort of try to make a hockey stick joke. Um, but, you know, we're not <laughs> looking for this. We're looking for, like, you know, that we just want to get repaid, right? So we're going to look at track record. If you're not profitable yet, um, I mean, that's tricky to enter the sector. I mean, this goes back to, you know, what is the right debt to equity ratio for this sector anyways? Um, I mean, even if you're reviewing a balance sheet at the time, you know, of due diligence, um, you see companies that are burning through equity, right? So are we going to put some more debt on a pile of debt on the reducing pile of equity? I mean, it's it's very tricky. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, we also raise money from a host of investors for our, you know, for the, the solar empowerment fund, the Beyond the Grid Solar Fund. And I have to say it is really all over the place. Um, I don't even know sometimes what impact means anymore. Um, so I, I'd love to let the others speak in the room. I'm sorry to be really frank, but, you know, there's this triple bottom line and then some people are saying, well, we want to see, you know, X households, but we also want to make this return. Um, and I'm like, uh, you know, these are really rural households, like the costs are going to be much higher to get there. 
Um, I feel like the impact investment community is actually a bit all over the place on this. I mean, where we speak to some people that can give us PRIs that are charging us like crazy interest rates that, you know, we actually, at the level that we would charge our customers. So um, I can't answer your question, but I sort of echo um, in sort of pressuring people to, to give us clarity as entrepreneurs. Um, and in terms of the right mix, I mean, it, Paul, I don't know if you can help me out here, but <laughs> well, um, uh, I, I don't see anyone that's profitable right now in the you know, pay-as-you-go space. There's some closer to than others. It really just depends on their business model. I see some people that, you know, if they've got more VC types um, on their cap table, obviously they're just going to, you know, go Amazon style and just keep adding value without being profitable. Or you've got some that are really wanting to just like stabilize their portfolio, have a very healthy portfolio, um, you know, prioritize uh, profitability before scale, and they'll have a very different set of investors on their cap table. Well, maybe two comments, one on impact and one on scale. Um, way back when the, the GIN Global Impact Investor Network was still to be developed, we had at ENCO like five or so indicators. And then when the group grew bigger, we had about 35 and then we had 81 indicators. And then we said, okay, let's stop there. It doesn't work because it's all you know flying yogurt hot air everything but it doesn't tell you anything yet it's it's assumptions divided by assumptions times assumptions and then you get zero as a result so what does it tell you so now i say any impact investor should present its particular preference for impact okay make sure you put a hierarchy and you only choose one to follow just one not two two is conflicting you can say I'll do this one and if it works I'll do also the second and then maybe even the third and if it works even the fourth but stick to one because you can only do one thing at a time with money because you get conflicted otherwise the risk being that you have to turn down investors who insist on doing five things at the same time because not offending anybody they may not know what they're talking about because there's not they've not been in your business they have not seen how um, how complex the business is and all the hurdles that you will have to, to pass to make it a success. You do a good job uh, also in Pakistan to explain that to investors by taking them along your journey. You know, if you've been successful in what you've been doing, tell them how your impact is. I mean, for example, if, they, if, if you're an investor from the US and you divert your capital to being invested in Africa, wherever you go and whatever you do, that alone is impact. Africa needs long-term capital at decent rates. It's very scarce. Whatever you do, whether it's jewelry, general manufacturing or solar, it has impact. Okay, So that's a little bit of an overrated or over whatever uh, for impact. So choose one and explain that you can't do anything else and make a hierarchy of the rest. That would work. Uh, and you will lose some investors, but you might have run into trouble with those investors anyway in the second year when you had you show a profit but didn't do that particular impact indicator. Uh, that's one. And then the last is on scale, uh, and I'm not going to make Nigerian jokes here, but uh, be clear about scale and timeline. Clear as in realistic. Uh, I prefer to see a two-year timeline where you do realize something uh, on a realistic basis rather than a 10, 10 year timeline where you serve 55 million people in one city that at that point only has 10 million inhabitants which I've seen right because you're so ambitious not you but in general you can be so ambitious say, we can do all this and I just want to see what you do in the next two years and I can dream myself on what would happen in the fifth and the tenth year so scale okay but distinguish between ambition which is fine to have good to have and realistic targets for one, two, maybe three years. Fabulous. I'm just going to cut it short there just because we're, we're needing to move on to the next bit of the session. So um, I think we're all staying in the room actually uh, because uh, then we're all speaking again for the second part. Uh, but we'll probably just be swiping the slides around. So maybe just uh, have a moment to turn to the person next to you asking the most uh, strangest thing that's ever happened in your investment life uh, and, uh, and just take two minutes while we change the slides over. And just briefly, uh, the next session is on term sheets, um, which is a subsection of what we've been discussing uh, this very hour. So, um, and we've only, I think, three or four sheets. So I'm happy to consider this as an extended and a more focused 
uh, discussion of what we're doing right now.